On behalf of the American Heart Association, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Social Determinants of Health and Inpatient Risk Prediction. My name is Kathy Thomas, and I am the Senior Manager of Registry Research for Quality Outcomes Research and Analytics with the American Heart Association. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review how to use this webinar platform for today's event. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can download a PDF in the handout section of your attendee control panel. If you experience technical difficulties, most user issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser. If that does not work, please contact GoToWebinar customer service team found in your confirmation and reminder email. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you will receive a link to access today's recording, a certificate of participation, as well as an invitation to complete our feedback survey. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter in the questions section. You may send in your questions at any time and we'll review the questions during our Q&A at the end of the presentation. Our agenda today includes a presentation from our guest speaker, Dr. Ambrish Pandey, updates from the American Heart Association, and we'll go into a Q&A if time allows. Again, you can submit your questions at any time via the question section. Dr. Pandey is an assistant professor of internal medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He completed his medical school training at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, India, followed by an internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, and master's in clinical research at UT Southwestern Medical Center. His clinical interests include the prevention and management of heart failure, and he is the medical director of the Heart Failure with Preserved Ejection Fraction Program at UT Southwestern. On the research front, he runs an NIH-funded independent research program that focuses on studying the epidemiology of heart failure using novel big data approaches, using healthcare services data to study care patterns and disparities in heart failure management, and evaluating novel implementation strategies to improve outcomes and reduce disparities among high-risk patients. He is also a member of the American Heart Association, where he serves on several committees, including the Scientific Sessions Planning Committee and the Epidemiology Early Career Committee. He has received numerous AHA awards, including the 2019-2020 Elizabeth Barrett Connor Research Award and the Stephen N. Blair Award for Excellence in Physical Activity Research. Dr. Pandey, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Kathy, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak on this important topic of how we can leverage big data approaches to achieve equity in heart failure risk prediction. Let me see if I can get the controls. Yes, should you? These are my disclosures for the talk today. So heart failure, as we all know, is associated with a high burden of morbidity and mortality. The lifetime risk of heart failure hospitalization from decompensation of the condition among patients with, a, with known prevalent disease is in excess of 80%. And the in-hospital mortality rate ranges from somewhere three to 5%, depending upon the cohort studied. However, the risk of adverse clinical outcomes associated with heart failure hospitalization is not distributed equally, and some individuals are at a higher risk than others. And this highlights the need for optimal approaches to identify risk and target treatment strategies among those who are at the highest risk of adverse outcomes. The risk of hospitalization and mortality in heart failure differs across race groups. A lot of epidemiological studies have demonstrated that individuals of uh, self-reported black race have a higher risk of heart failure hospitalization and often noted to have a lower risk of mortality compared to individuals of white race and other race groups. 
This is particularly relevant as risk-based approach has become a standard of clinical care and risk scores are often being used to screen for therapeutic needs, allocate finite healthcare resources, and predict the risk of adverse outcomes. The slide here shows some of the commonly used risk scores for allocating therapies among patients with heart disease. We are all familiar with the STS score for cardiac surgery risk assessment, the CHATS to WASC risk score for stroke risk assessment and atrial fibrillation, and even the recent hypertension guidelines recommend using ASCVD risk to allocate intensive blood pressure management among individuals with moderately elevated blood pressure. For patients with heart failure, the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Risk Score is one such risk assessment tool that was developed to predict the risk of in-hospital mortality among hospitalized patients with heart failure. The Get With The Guidelines Risk Score, like many other clinical risk scores, incorporates self-reported race as a biological risk factor with lower risk assigned to patients of black versus non-black race. And concerns have been raised about this race-based approach that assigns lower risk to black patients, such that there may be a, an increase in the threshold required for risk-based allocation of clinical therapies, which can add to the existing disparities in heart failure care. The use of race as a covariate in traditional heart failure risk scores has been the focus of debate in recent times and the problematic nature of this approach was elegantly highlighted by authors of this perspective in New England Journal of Medicine last year. And the criticisms of the existing risk prediction approach among heart failure patients is not without evidence. Observations of disparities in rates of admission to primary cardiology service among Black and Latinx patients versus patients of white race hospitalized with heart failure have been reported in the literature. In a study from a large academic center in Boston, investigators reported that compared to white patients, Black and Latinx patients were less likely to be admitted to cardiology service for heart failure care. And this was relevant because admission to cardiology service decreased the readmission rate within 30 days, independent of the race. Altogether, the emerging evidence argues for us to find a potential alternative approaches to risk prediction that do not use race as a biological risk factor or compare risk between black versus white patients. A potential solution would be to rather assess risk in a race specific manner. This approach acknowledges that the outcomes are different between races and looks at risk gradients within each race strata and allows us to identify risk factors that are most relevant to the specific risk. To develop better approaches to risk prediction among patients of self-reported black race, we have to better understand the drivers of risk among patients of self-reported black race. Black race is a social construct and a heterogeneous exposure of which genetic African ancestry that encompasses biological basis of risk is just one component. Much of the increased risk among self-reported black patients is driven by contribution of racial discrimination and social stratification manifested in reduced access to care and lower, so lower socioeconomic status seen within the African-American communities. As a result, the utility of race identity as a predictor of risk in cardiovascular research is indeed flawed. The lack of biological basis of increased risk among patients of black race versus other race groups is highlighted in a study by Cooper and colleagues where the investigators demonstrated that African origin populations with lower social status in multiracial societies such as the United States and South Africa experienced more hypertension than anticipated based on the anthropometric and measurable socioeconomic factors and this difference was not observed in more racially homogeneous societies, such as those observed in African countries like Ghana. More recently, 
work from the sprint trial demonstrated that when access to care is comparable across race groups, such as in the setting of a randomized control trial, which uh, the sprint trial was, blood pressure response to therapy does not differ among self-reported black individuals across different strata of West African ancestry, further highlighting that it is the access to the care or the access to the treatment that is a strong driver of adverse outcomes in these patients of self-reported black race and not necessarily any underlying biology that makes them less suited to respond to specific therapies. Thus, these observations suggest that extrinsic and structural societal factors such as low socioeconomic status, racial discrimination, and poor access to care, more than the differences in biology, are the major drivers of the well-established racial disparity in cardiovascular health. These extrinsic and societal factors and lived experience contribute to worse social determinants of health among patients of black race and drive the increased risk of adverse outcome in these patients. Now, the traditional risk assessment models do not adequately capture these unique drivers of risk, which are unequally distributed and have differential importance across race groups. The limitations of the traditional risk models stems from the flawed approach of including race as a covariate and also from the limitations of the traditional risk prediction tools, which do not fully account for the interaction between risk parameters and are overtly sensitive to missingness in data and do not capture the non-linearity in the relationship between parameters and outcomes. Next slide. This is where big data approaches to risk prediction could be useful. Specifically, machine learning tools are efficient, can efficiently utilize large multidimensional data to develop separate models to predict the risk of adverse outcomes in black and white adults. Next slide. So how does an ML-based risk prediction model address the limitations of traditional modeling approaches? ML models are less restrictive and can incorporate a large number of risk factors. They provide greater generalizability and better tolerance of missing data. ML models like the random forest models stratify cohorts based on the importance of key risk factors and create a decision tree within each strata. And this allows the models to take a race specific approach and identify risk factors that are unique to each race group. Next slide. The schematic here shows how a random forest model, which is a form of ML risk prediction model, works. It builds decision trees on different samples and takes their majority votes for classification and risk assessment. This process is run iteratively on thousands of bootstrap samples, which may have varying degree of missingness in different parameters. Next slide. And using this bootstrap approach over a large number of samples, Samples, the random first models can stratify the cohort based on the importance of key risk factors and create a decision tree within each stratum. This allows the ML model to take a unique race specific approach, particularly if race appears as an early node variable and identify risk factors that are unique within each race group. Next slide. The importance of different risk factors in predicting risk in these ML models is determined based on the variable importance metric, which is identified by how higher the variable appears in the decision tree model. And then the optimal number of predictors can be ascertained for these modeling approaches by looking at the improvement in the C index or the discrimination index of the models as we add more parameters. For example, on the in this graph on your wrist, on your right, you can see that adding variables beyond 20 shown on the y, shown on the x axis, does not really improve the C index or the area under the receiver, receiver operating curve much, highlighting that the model achieves kind of saturation in its optimal risk prediction with 20 variables or so. Next slide. And we have used this ML-based model for predicting risk and heart failure among community-based individuals of self-reported black and white race, pooling data from multiple cohort studies. In these 
experiment, we developed race-specific random survival forest models to predict the risk of incident heart failure and compared its performance to other traditional models in external validation cohorts. Next slide. We observed that in these models, the ML model outperformed the traditional heart failure risk prediction models comfortably, highlighting that the ML models were better suited to adapt to predicting risk in black and white adults much better than the traditional heart failure risk prediction models. Next slide. And not only did the ML models outperform the traditional risk prediction models, they were also able to identify unique risk factors within each race groups. While the traditional heart failure risk models estimate risk using the same set of covariates for individuals irrespective of their uh, uh, racial background, the ML models were more flexible and were able to identify unique risk factors for each race subgroup. The plot here shows the population attributable risk for each covariate in black and white adults with the most important variables shown at the top of the screen. And as you can see here, while the most important variable for each race includes the nitritic peptide levels, there is difference in the and uh, high sensitivity troponin markers. Can you go to the next slide? One more. Next slide. And you can see uh, the, the slide before. You can see the distribution of the socioeconomic parameters varied among patients of self-reported black versus white race. In the self-reported black race individuals, socioeconomic parameters like income and education level featured in the top five or six predictors, while they were not as prominently uh, featured with education coming much lower in the top uh, predictor variable list for the self-reported white race individuals. Next slide. So now that we have seen that ML models can improve risk prediction for incident heart failure among community dwelling adults, what about predicting risk among patients hospitalized with heart failure who are at a higher baseline risk? Next slide. In a recent study from the Get With The Guidelines heart failure cohort, we developed ML models of in-hospital mortality risk for patients hospitalized with heart failure. We developed these models in both race agnostic and race specific ways and compared its performance against the existing Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Risk model that was derived using the traditional logistic regression approach with race as a covariate and also using a newly derived logistic regression model that also included race as a covariate but with a more expanded list of covariates. The models were developed using a large set of patients from the Get With The Guidelines registry that included over 450,000 patients from 855 hospitals. Next slide. Next slide. And the models were validated in the ERIC community surveillance cohort of patients who were hospitalized with heart failure. The ERIC community surveillance cohort is based out of four centers and heart failure hospitalization events are captured in this multi-center community surveillance study since 2005 with adjudication of each heart failure hospitalization event. The validation cohort included over 3,143 heart failure hospitalizations in around over 1,000 black patients and over 2,000 self-reported white race patients. Next slide. The ML models were able to incorporate a large number of risk factors across multiple domains as shown sequentially on this slide. This included data on demographics. Next slide. Data on vital signs such as heart rate, blood pressure, body mass index, respiratory rate. Next slide. We also included data from medical history, including list of comorbidities that are shown here, as well as other data set that are shown on the subsequent slides. Next slide.
The data incorporated also symptoms and signs of heart failure hospitalization, including presence of chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea, fatigue, palpitations, uh, proximal nocturnal dyspnea. Next slide. And also data on cardiac biomarkers such as uh, high sensitivity troponin, BNP, and other uh, uh, lab parameters, including sodium, BUN, potassium, hemoglobin. Next slide. And finally, we also included data on EKG and echocardiographic parameters such as the ejection fraction and measures of QRS and other EKG intervals. Next slide. So coming to the model performance in the external cohort, in the subset of black patients in the external cohort, the machine learning models performed well with a C index of 0.79 and adequate calibration as shown in the table here. The performance of the race specific model was superior to the traditional get with the guidelines heart failure risk score, as well as the re-derived logistic regression model that included race as a covariate, which had a C index of 0.71 and an adequate calibration, but the calibration performance was lower than what was observed for the ML models. Next slide. And similar pattern of results were obtained in the subset of patients with self-reported white race in the external validation cohort, where the ML models outperformed the get with the guidelines traditional risk score model and the re-derived logistic regression model with a higher C index and better calibration metrics. Next slide. Taken together, these findings suggested that the ML models performed better than the traditional uh, logistic regression-based models that use race as a covariate in predicting in-hospital mortality among both patients of self-reported black race as well as those of self-reported white race. Next slide. Now, we also looked at the decision curve analysis to assess the prognostic utility of the ML models as compared to the other traditional logistic regression models. In decision curve analysis, among patients of self-reported black race, which is shown on the, uh, in the graph on your left, at the base event rate of 5%, the race-specific ML model detected an additional four to nine mortality events per 1,000 patients screened as compared with the other models that had race as a covariate. In this graph, we have the risk threshold on the x-axis and the net benefit is shown on the y-axis. And as you can see, the ML model curve is shifted upwards consistent with better prognostic performance. And similar pattern of improved prognostic utility was also noted for ML models in the white race subgroup as shown in the decision curves on your right. Next slide. So we see that the ML models that incorporated clinical variables performed better than the traditional heart failure risk models. However, that is not the complete story as we discussed earlier, that much of the risk of adverse events in black patients is driven by their social determinants of health. So we also improved our clinical ML model by incorporating social determinants of health data and evaluating if that improved the risk prediction performance of these models. Next slide. The data on social determinants of health were linked to the patient level data from Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Study Cohort through their available zip codes for residents. Next slide. Overall, we added 27 social determinants of health parameters to the covariate pool by using zip code level uh, STOH data obtained from different publicly available STOH data sets. Next slide. And when we compare the performance of the models that included both STOH parameters and the clinical parameters, versus the ML model with clinical parameters only, we observed that the models incorporating STOH parameters had better discrimination and calibration performance among patients of self-reported black race as compared with the model that included clinical parameters only. Next slide. Next slide. Furthermore, in decision curve analysis, addition of social determinants of health parameters to the risk prediction model led to the detection of an additional three events per thousand patients of self-reported black race as shown in this graph with an upward shift in the 
decision curve for the clinical plus STOH model as compared with the clinical model only. Next slide. And when we compare this to uh, patients of non-black race, inclusion of STOH parameters to the ML-based risk prediction model did not lead to an improvement in model performance, risk reclassification, or additional events detected in the decision curve analyses, highlighting that the incorporation of STOH parameters had most value in terms of improving risk prediction among patients of black race but not so much for patients of self-reported non-black race or white race. Next slide. We also looked at whether the proportion of black patients who were identified as high risk would be changed by using ML-based risk models versus the traditional get with the guideline risk prediction model. We observed that the proportion of black patients who would be considered above each specific risk threshold of 2% risk, 5% risk, or 7% risk was much higher using the ML models as compared to the traditional get with the guidelines heart failure model. And this is particularly relevant as it suggests that a higher proportion of black patients would be identified above specific risk threshold, which may be relevant to risk-based allocation of care and may just and may thus lead to greater uh, number of patients of self-reported black race getting uh, uh, that uh, risk-based uh, care in the healthcare setting. Next slide. So, in conclusion, ML-based risk prediction models demonstrated excellent model performance, even in presence of data missingness, using pragmatic large real-world data sets. And these models were superior to existing models that use traditional risk prediction approaches and incorporated race as a covariate. Next slide. Social determinants of health were more important predictors of risk in black patients and improved risk classification in black patients, but not so much in patients of self-reported white race. Next slide. And overall, our study findings suggest that moving towards a race conscious approach in risk prediction may help achieve better risk prediction in patients of self-reported black race and incorporating social determinants of health parameters in our risk assessment may help uh, achieve more equity in risk, in risk identification and downstream allocation of health resources. Next slide. And I would like to thank our collaborators and AHA uh, for supporting our work and the Precision Medicine Platform especially which was used to perform all the analyses and the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure cohort who were uh, generous enough to provide us with their data sets for developing these models. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. Um, I'm going to stay off video just to maintain our internet connection here. And as a reminder, to any of the attendees, you can enter questions into the question pane of the control panel. But now we wanted to dive a little bit deeper and share some things that here at AHA we are working on on behalf of health equity. There we go. So I wanted to share that um, our 2024 impact goal from the American Heart Association includes um, the health equity topic and being champions of health equity. So addressing both medical and non-medical barriers is crucial to achieving health and well-being for everyone, including those who've been disproportionately affected by cardiovascular disease due to structural racism and other social determinants of health. Furthermore, our official more detailed statement on health equity is that everyone deserves an optimal and just opportunity to be healthy, giving special attention to the needs of those at greatest risk of poor health. No one should be disadvantaged from achieving their potential because of social position or any other socially defined circumstance. And so heading into the guidelines here, we have a presidential advisory that was a call to action on structural racism and health disparities. And then furthermore, we wanted to kind of get into how the Get With a Guidelines Quality Improvement Program can be used to inspire equitable care. 
So fondly known as our peacock here, the image to the right shows our impact areas and reiterates that the heart of our mission is equity. The American Heart Association's quality improvement programs work to narrow gaps and disparities by converting guidelines into clinical practice to improve patient outcomes. And specifically, we're going to look at the heart failure tool in particular. So as most of you know, we had a guideline update regarding the guideline for management of heart failure this uh, past May in 2022. And in that guideline um, pulled out specifically is to identify cardiac and non-cardiac diseases, lifestyle and behavioral factors, and social determinants of health, which may cause or worsen heart failure. And again, one of the class one recommendations is in vulnerable pa patient populations at risk for health disparities, heart failure risk assessments and multidisciplinary management strategies should target both known risks for CVD and social determinants of health as a means toward elimination of disparate heart failure outcomes. And again, this is a level one um, evidence-based practice to, evident, to recommend evidence of health disparities should be monitored and addressed at the clinical practice and the healthcare system levels. So how have we tried to address that within Get With the Guidelines? So many of you that use the tool may have noticed that we've added health equity data elements We've always sort of been a health equity tool, but now we've included additional data elements to look at patient gender identity, patient identified sexual orientation, in addition to date of birth or age, zip code, payment source, and in addition, various race, race and ethnicity factors. We've also included in our tool a health related social needs assessment. And so with this, we know that your individual system may have a way to collect this information. So wanting to have a more general way for you to include this information in your abstraction of your acute heart failure patients in this example, um, to make sure that you're identifying these opportunities and then perhaps what are you doing about those identified areas of unmet need. And so using the Get With the Guidelines tool, once this information is entered, you can start to look at this information and start to look at your health equity, or I'm sorry, your heart failure patient outcomes from the perspective of health equity. So looking at um, the various patients here in this example report that's from a demonstration hospital to see where are some of the barriers facing your patients. Here's another example of how you can use one of our outcome measures and then filter it by the health equity data elements to look at, you know, maybe you're meeting the discharge appointment 85% of the time and you're meeting that goal for your Get With the Guidelines award, but how do you take that one step further and how do you look at the data from a health equity lens and see, are there gaps? Are we missing a certain patient population and how do we try to address that patient population? And in addition, you can work with your quality manager to really look at how, how can we use this data and ask yourself, what are some of the things we're seeing across our data? How can we take our data a step further? What are the unmet social needs of your patient population? Are there any disparities? Start asking those questions, or maybe those questions are coming from your, your leader community about, are there health disparities that we're seeing are there any delays in care and are there any differences in education provided at discharge and really looking at the outcomes research are there health disparities between race sex in disposition discharge at your institution and what are some of the factors and challenges that you can look at to hopefully reduce those gaps now we'll get into some additional real world applications in addition to what dr pandy had spoken about we have several get with a guideline powered research articles addressing uh, care disparities, and we've listed them here. And again, these slides are available in the handout section of your control pane. We have additional articles here specific to heart failure and health disparities. And then we have our wonderful Implement HF team, and I'm going to pass this over to my colleague. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm Sruthi Cherker, Quality Programs Manager at the AHA. Just to share a little bit more about how Implement HF, one of our 
um, implementation science initiatives is also kind of working to address some of those health related social needs and health equity within the initiative. So for those who may not be familiar, this is a national heart failure initiative with the goal of increasing healthy time at home for all patients with heart failure with an overarching aspirational goal of decreasing all cause mortality by 5%. And our vision is to really build this multi-stakeholder community where we bring implementation science um, embraced by different pillars of a learning healthcare system, value and policy, patient engagement, to really achieve that goal of precise heart failure management and improve outcomes for all patients. And so one thing we really focus on within this initiative is health-related social needs, um, understanding that the guidelines recommend that we focus on patients with varied needs. And so Using the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Registry, much of the way that Jessica just walked through, um, making this measure a priority for the group that's working with an implementation, implement HF, and to really focus on the data collection and taking it a step further and not just looking at the data, but seeing as a cohort, you know, what are the challenges, the barriers, working further upstream to see how we can optimize our EMR um, tools, how the collaborative can kind of share their pressure points and their strategies. Um, and work with the group as a whole to kind of develop some quality improvement around health equity and not just um, capturing the data, but doing something with the data. And to really make sure that our um, initiative participants are, you know, focusing this on this at an individual uh, hospital level, but also across their systems and across their regions as a whole. Uh, something else we wanted to share with you all is the Find Help resource, which is a new uh, resource developed by AHA as part of Implement HF, but available to everybody, and it's um, findhelp.org. It's meant for both patients and providers, and it's really a great tool to find different types of resources um, to help kind of take it to that next step. So once you identify, you know, your patients might be having medication access issues, transportation to follow-up issues, issues with health literacy, or maybe even um, legal issues that are kind of preventing them from accessing the care that they need, Going to this uh, website, you can hone in on that specific category and then search further by um, your zip code to identify specific resources out there that are available. You can further filter by um, income level and just a bunch of different things to help hone in on exactly what your patients may need. So this may be something you can click around in and help connect your patients to or connect them with and they can search through it as well. Um, maybe it's also sharing this as a resource to caregivers. So we highly encourage you to please go check this out and share this amongst your peers. Great, thank you. And yes, that's a wonderful resource to check out. And we have a few additional resources here at AHA that we have created. Um, so getting back to um, the data piece, you know, and kind of understanding where your organization is at and what maybe you can do at your organization. So we have several e-learning courses on our elearning.heart.org related to health equity and social determinants of health. And so please feel free to access any of these wonderful resources and share them with your teams. We've also created two specific Get With The Guidelines resources. We have a document here, this is in your handout section. So this is kind of explains why you're collecting this information and again, can be used at your hospital to really, to really champion this effort and perhaps get some additional support. And then we have a how document. So kind of going into further what I um, displayed for you earlier, but really a step-by-step -step instruction of how to look at your data within the Get With The Guidelines tool from a health equity lens. We also did a wonderful webinar last year around this time, about a year ago <laughs> today, um, where we talked about, again, using data to inspire equitable care and we had two wonderful presenters. So feel free to access that resource as well. And then you may be asking, you know, we have to start somewhere first. And first we need to really collect this information accurately and completely. And so we have a wonderful webinar that was done by our target BP team that really goes into best practice sharing and model sharing on what are strategies that you can implement at your organization to make sure that you're collecting accurate and complete race and ethnicity data. 
I do have a, a disclaimer here about our get with, using Get With a Guidelines uh, hospital information in hospital level research. So our wonderful Kathy Thomas, who was on earlier, <laughs> spoke of this. But here's just our policy and any questions or concerns you may have about using your Get With a Guidelines data for research, you can send to our team here. All right, and we'll head now into the discussion and question, question and answers. Let me see here if we have any questions that came in. And again, feel free to put them in the question pane of, of the control panel. Okay. We had a question come in, where's the best place to find an approved list of social determinant of health questions to incorporate into inpatient admission questions that will satisfy Get With the Guidelines and CMS? That is a wonderful question. So in our Get With the Guidelines tool, we have a pretty basic um, form where we're at least asking the general topic information. So that would be a great place to start. But as I mentioned from some of those resources, there are some model sharing and best practice sharing from some of the hospitals that have decided to share their um, the way that they collect this social determinant of health information at their site. And then Dr. Pandey, I think this one is for really for you. Is there talk about um, more of like a standardized um, questionnaire for social determinants of health and the hospitals kind of using that in integration with each EHRs? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, there has been work that is ongoing. Epic has actually, if if your EHR is Epic, Epic actually has a tab of social determinants of health related information that it uh, suggests to routinely capture. So I think that is a, a useful resource. And then NIH has developed a Phoenix tool, which is basically a phenom phenotyping tool for from social determinants of health standpoint that are currently being proposed to, to be utilized for patients in terms of assessing their social needs and also uh, other uh, social determinants of health. So I think uh, more and more work is being done to standardize data capture and standardize how we can capture uh, information on social determinants of health in EMR-based health systems. Right now, uh, I think income education and uh, I think zip code level information on where the patient lives are the best, I think, are the most studied ones. But I think over time, I think this is going to improve as we invest more and more resources in better capturing the social determinants of health. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we had another question come in. So this this topic today was really focused on heart failure, but do we have at AHA any social determinant of health research on resuscitation? So from those resources, you can access our uh, research publication page where you can specifically look for uh, research done using Get With the Guidelines resuscitation and social determinants of health. Um, I will also underscore that the social determinants of health questionnaire is available in the resuscitation tool as well. Um, so if that information is being collected at your site and you would like to perhaps conduct some research, <laughs> you can um, use that and please connect with your quality manager to, to look into that further or if you would like to speak on that topic in particular, we'd be happy to connect you. But yes, we're looking at this information, this health equity information from all, all of our tools. So what other social determinant of health data are available to see at AHA, such as preferred language? So that's a great question. Um, that's not specifically in our um, health-related social needs assessment questionnaire, but I do believe that that is um, asked in terms of education that was done um, for the patients during their inpatient stay. Um, and we have many of our resources available in various languages on heart.org. And if there's anything specific you're looking for, please feel free to reach out to your quality manager that supports your Get With the Guidelines program. Dr. Pandy, we have another question for you about, um, you know, we may have a standardized tool that is used across the board. You know, that's a great place to get to, but how do we then take it to the next step of 
um, streamlining the education of actually using that tool and making sure that each provider that uses it is deploying it in the same way. So we have a consistent way of kind of making sure we're addressing patient needs. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think something that is solely needed as we move uh, in the direction of better capturing social determinants of health data. I think the first step is to come up with instruments that are standardized and can be implemented across different hospitals and healthcare settings. The next step is to make sure that uh, we have adequate training or information available on implementation of those tools to uh, ensure standardized capture of data. I think some of this would, would involve, I think, training that happens at the level of uh, data abstractors or data collect collection to make sure that we are extracting the right information in the same way across all centers. But when it comes to obtaining the information from the patient, I think uh, we have to use standardized tools that, that are very clear in terms of the information being asked for and the information being captured. And that is done currently at the census level. When we get census information, a lot of social determinants of health data is captured in a standardized manner from the general population. I think we can bring the same approach to hospitals and, 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 and collect data in a, in, a, in a standardized fashion using these uh, uh, validated standardized tools. So I think if we implement uh, standardized tools, I think that can actually uh, help us get to a stage where the data capture is uniform across hospitals and healthcare settings. Thank you. And Dr. Pandey, can you speak a little bit to the process at your hospital? Are, are some, is some of this information collected during their admission process? You know, when you're collecting um, payer information, is it done with the nursing assessment? Is it done at discharge? What are, what are some strategies that you've found at your facility to help collect this information? So in, in our clinic, when, in, in my HFPEF clinic, when I'm seeing patients, I think we, we do focus on collecting uh, data and information on social de determinants of health. Actually, we have a registry ongoing called Social HF Registry, where we are spending extra time on collecting detailed social determinants of health information using well-validated questionnaires from the uh, NMHID Phoenix Toolkit. And uh, we're focusing on medical literacy, focusing on uh, healthcare needs outside the health setting, healthcare setting, and focusing on income and access to uh, to pharmacies and, and, and things that are most relevant. So I think uh, from our standpoint, we have uh, dedicated resources that are going into uh, collecting information on social determ determinants of health among patients who are hospitalized with heart failure as part of a, a research initiative. And the idea is that once we get, uh, once we can demonstrate success with this approach, we can uh, scale it up to the whole health system uh, as a quality improvement initiative, uh, not just as a research initiative. So I think such kind of efforts are needed to, to better capture these information. And I think resources have to be put in by the hospital towards these, uh, these efforts so that we can have enough, uh, I think, uh, mandate and enough resources to capture these data. Thank you. And have you found at your organization any any champions or stakeholders that were really important to have at the table for these discussions? Yeah, I think uh, then it has to in involve almost like everyone because the care is such a team uh, team game in, in, in the current scenario. I think the nursing administration, the discharge team, the primary uh, team taking care of the patient during the hospitalization and the pharmacy, which actually uh, I think takes care of the, the the of the medication dispensing. I think all of them have to be involved, and I think we have to make sure that we, we may not be able to capture all domains of data at one one specific uh, I think in one specific setting, but we can capture data relevant to different domains across different uh, I think settings if we incorporate each of these stakeholders in 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 this mission. And I think that's what I think is kind of needed that uh, will that will ensure that we don't uh, put too much uh, on one uh, individual uh, stakeholders plate, but we as a team can collectively capture different domains of data to piece together the full picture of the social determinants of health among patients. Great, thank you so much. So as a reminder, the slides and a few other resources are available in the handout section of the control panel that you can download and share with your teams and a recording will be sent out um, of this presentation shortly to all registered 
attendees. But on behalf of the American Heart Association and Dr. Pandey, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope that this was a helpful uh, presentation to really inspire you to look at your data with a health equity lens. Thank you. Thank you.